So for the member banks who are returning, welcome back and also welcome to our new participants on EBP and how these are great programs to help your borrowers sustain successful home ownership. And like I said, we will be recording today's training, but this uh, webinar is really just to provide you the details on how do you request that disbursement and what proper um, QCs do you need to do before you're closing your first mortgage financing in conjunction with our grant programs? So we're gonna get into talking about the, the overall process, what documents do we require, um, what do you have to do when you're monitoring the grant because there is a five-year retention period. And then we're gonna get into some details about what you need to um, provide and record for notes and mortgages. I won't go too into detail about the workflow, but basically we're at the point where step four, your organization has received the approval for the grant and um, your institution will be closing your first mortgage financing. You will be table funding the grant. And then once your closing takes place for your grant recipient, you're going to go through our online portal and then you're going to request the disbursement, which is that reimbursement of the grant. And that is a two tier review through our community lending platform. And we do say allow 20 business days for us to review and send the reimbursement to your institution's ideal way account we just build in a little extra time in comparison to when we review the the income portion just because of month end um, sometimes from a time standpoint if you're submitting at the end of the month and we're trying to close the books as well as your institution so it's something just to kind of be mindful of when you're communicating with your accounting department where your organization does table fund the grant. Of course, we do try to turn them around a lot faster. Um, and we're here today to really learn um, how to be successful. And the cleaner the disbursement requests, the, the quicker we hopefully can anticipate funding your institution's ideal way account. So the requirements of your organization, um, make sure that you have that appreciation that you have to send all the documents within our community lending platform. So if you are new to the program or maybe um, you haven't operated on the disbursement side previously, to get yourself a community lending login, you can request a first time user account. Uh, and that is uh, an individual account. So please don't share the passwords. Um, and then submitting all disbursements through that platform. We don't accept any documents in email. Um, so everything goes through our, our online submission process, just like our enrollment um, portion. And making sure that the closing disclosure of the CD reflects the grant, either the equity builder or the how. We'll get into some details of what our do's and don'ts um, when you're reflecting this on your CD and then recording and executing either the EVP or how mortgages in notes. Remember to use the current version. So if you are returning to the program, please purge yourself of any prior documents. We can't accept any old versions because those templates specifically referred to the year that the home buyer received the grant. And the templates are program specific, so you can't interchange the EBP templates with the how because they are for different income brackets and they do have some, some nuances from one another. So just make sure when you are executing the documents, which grant did your borrower receive? And then all first time home buyers must complete education and counseling and we'll get into detail about that today. And then there are a couple of EBP specific items that we'll get into, uh, the member concession, and then 
EVP can be used to do rehab. So we do have a little carve out slide that will go through um, what we require for that. When you're looking at all of the documents that we need, um, just really making sure that everything correlates to one another, um, you know, making sure that you have the names, the dates, the grant amounts, address, everything ticks and ties when you're looking at the PNS, the closing disclosure, and our mortgage and note for that respective uh, grant. And, um, if something has changed at time of PNS, whether you know the property address might differ, especially if it's a new construction. Um, if you just have an address affidavit, um, sometimes we know with condos, especially unit numbers can kind of be a little tricky. Or if you're in a part of New England that has um, a village or a different town name um, that's you know kind of specific if you're from that area um, and then also knowing that no more than 250 cash back that's a regulatory hard stop for us and if that is the case that you are encouraged to uh, do this before closing by reducing the loan amount or the grant, um, and if for some reason you have not caught this at time of closing, then you would have to do a principal reduction. If you ever have any questions about that area um, prior to closing, please reach out to myself or our home ownership team. We're happy to go through that with you. We do have a section in our EVP how procedures that goes over the requirements of that. And then just noting from the closing side that the EMD must stay in the transaction. Um, it can't come out. And um, just making sure that what they say at um, PNS is is still um, still rings true because our home ownership programs have a minimum buyer contribution of their own funds, and we'll get into that today as well. And like I said, using either of the EVP or how retention documents, and just really ensuring that that first time home buyer um, completes the counseling and education. And we'll talk about what those certificates look like today as well. We do have a couple of questions. If buyers are first time homeowners, do they both need to complete the counseling or just one of them? That's actually a great question. We only require one adult household member to complete the first time home buyer education and counseling. Of course, we strongly encourage all first time home buyers to take it, but for this requirement, um, it's just one adult household member. And then one question, is this process completed prior to the closing or after? So when you are approved for the enrollment, that's an initial reservation for when the um, when your organization will request uh, the income to be reviewed, will then issue an approval for that enrollment, and then your financial institution is going to close your first mortgage, record all of our documents. And then you're going to request the disbursement through the portal, which is to reimburse. So essentially, um, your institution is table funding the grant. So some procedural reminders, as I said, our website does have our EVP how procedures in either of the landing page. Just remember that uh, every reservation is home buyer specific. Subject properties can change. Um, however, I do want to caution if that does happen uh, before closing, just making sure you're uploading that, uh, that current purchase and sales agreement and then making sure that if there are any changes to the purchase price or the earnest money, um, that that has been refined before closing. Also, just knowing that they are home buyer specific, which means that our program is income driven. So on the post closing side, just really making sure if that property address has changed and it's in a different county, 
you want to make sure that you're still in compliance. So if you know that a property address is changing, please just reach out to us and we can work with your institution on updating that reservation. And then disbursements are to be submitted within 90 days of the enrollment approval. So we do have an extension process. I do recommend taking a deeper dive in our EVP how procedures. We do allow 60 day extension maximums. However, we do have some carve outs specifically if a property is a new construction for our equity builder program. And then the how program has to be dispersed by calendar year end. So just being able to appreciate the nuances of the programs because one's regulated, one's voluntary. So we have certain specifications that we have to disperse the money within a timely manner. And then when you're looking at your CD, do not reflect our grant as a loan. Um, typically we will see people say that it's just FHLB grant or EDP or how grant. Um, it does not require a separate CD because it's a grant. There's only a five-year retention period. There is no monthly P&I. Um, so it's going to be on your third page of your first mortgage closing disclosure. And then, as I mentioned, the CD must reflect the buyer's minimum contribution and EBP and how have uh, different uh, thresholds. EBP is $500 and then how is 3% of the sales price. And like I said, all of the earnest money must stay in the transaction regardless if um, they have exceeded our minimum requirement, it, it must remain into the transaction. We do have a couple of questions. If a borrower paid for the appraisal out of pocket, are they able to receive that back in addition to the 250 EMD requirement already met? So they cannot receive more than 250 cash back. That's our hard stop. So if you are looking to reimburse them for the appraisal, you're going to have to just make sure that that cash to close does not exceed 250. So if you have to make some adjustments to your loan amount, you can you can do so. If a purchase falls through on a specific property, the funds reserve, can they go toward another property they find? Great question. So we say that they have 60 days to find a new property in our EVP how procedures. So if a property does fall through for some reason, maybe it doesn't appraise out or the home inspection doesn't go well, if you know that that borrower is working with a realtor and has other properties lined up in the queue, you can allow them 60 days to uh, execute that PNS. And then unfortunately, if for some reason they are unable to find a property that they're satisfied with, then you would have to withdraw that grant and that money would go back to the general pool. Um, and then, you know, when they're locked and ready, hopefully they have another opportunity. Should the down payment assistance and closing costs be broken out into two line items on the CD or just one line item? Great question. Just one line item. So whatever that uh, grant amount is. So for the equity builder, the maximum grant amount is 29,000. You would just indicate that it was the EVP grant on the third page of the CD. And then for how it is either 10% of the sales price or 25,000 and it's the lesser of the two. And the copy of today's presentation, it is actually in the handouts. That was one of the questions. On the how program, can 3% of the sales price be funds um, that are gift money. So no, it has to be the borrower's own funds for both of the minimum contributions. If they get anything in excess of 3%, that's a gift or a gift of equity. That is, that's not a problem, but that 3% does have to be their own money. And can the balance of minimum contribution be due at closing on the contract? So 
yes, it can be a mixture of earnest money deposit and cash to close. I want to heavily caution any institution that does this because if these numbers do shift and they have not met that full 3%, whether it is prior to or cash to close, your institution could be in jeopardy of not being reimbursed the grant amount. So it is it is allowed. Um, we do allow that for the equity builder program, but with how, because it used to be a match program where it was a two to one match, we're allowing that flexibility because we did anticipate and understand that this was a challenge for buyers at time of PNS to come up with all of this money prior to the closing, especially if they were liquidating some assets. But I just want you to be mindful that you put your institution at risk if you do not meet that minimum requirement. There is no exception to that. Um, that is a hard stop for us. So for EBP, we do require your institution to give a concession or an incentive. We do get a lot of questions about if you have this for EBP, can you also mirror it for how? It's not required. This is a regulatory component that we implement for EBP because it is um, tied in accordance with the Federal Housing Finance Agency uh, set aside into home ownership for federal home owning systems. Um, if you do want to offer it to how just to keep it uniform, maybe you don't know which borrower is eligible, you certainly can. Um, it must be provided at time of closing, so it should be evidence on the closing disclosure or documents that um, are able to support. And then when you're submitting that disbursement, explaining in detail, being specific. So here are some examples on the right that it's a lender credit that can be reflected on either two or three of the CD. Tell us what the amount is, because we do understand that some people might give some other credits just based on your, um, your pricing to your borrowers. Um, if you're waiving or reducing a fee, um, just letting us know what that original fee costs and saying, you know, it's, it should be in section A, um, it, it's at $0 or it's reduced by $200. Below market rate, we do require a rate sheet and just spell it out for us. Let us know because especially if you're giving us a rate sheet that has pricing adjustments and it's not really straightforward saying that, you know, the interest rate was 6% and we're giving a um, half a point, just be clear and communicative about that. And then if you're using expanded underwriting guidelines, uh, we do require either a copy of your guidelines or the policy, if, especially if it's a portfolio. For example, we have some institutions that they waive MI or they reduce it. Um, and we just need something in writing showing what that is. All right, we do have a lot of other questions. How can the balance of the borrower's minimum contribution be due? And oh, actually I already answered that one. Do you have a final grant CD approval process or is it up to the lender to apply the grant correctly per program guidelines? Great question. So we don't have a um, like a pre-closing CD review. However, if you're new to the program and you really just want to make sure you have everything right for that first one, you know, we're happy to work with you and um, crunching the numbers, just making sure everything is accurate and reflected but we don't have a formal process for that um, in the handouts tab that's why we do have that member qc checklist it's not required it's optional but it's just something that can really make sure you have the checks and balances um, before you are closing your first mortgage with the grant because your institution is table funding all right so for ebp only this is not applicable to how uh, the grant can be used toward rehab of that primary purchase. I want to caution that when you encounter this, that we need to have 100% of the work completed and we need all of the documentation to support that rehab component. 
Um, so you cannot submit that disbursement request. And if you do, unfortunately, we cannot reimburse until we have all of the materials that, like I said, the 100% of the work completed, the closing disclosure needs to evidence that the funds are held in escrow. We need all of the paid invoices detailing the scope of work, um, the evidence that your institution has uh, done the disbursement from their escrow account, and then providing copies in, of checks paid to the contractor or the home buyer. Um, and then that final inspection or confirmation that the work has been completed, especially where um, we have encountered last year that because contractors were in such a high demand and kind of have been backed up a little bit, a lot of buyers might have shifted to DIY and it might take them a little longer, unfortunately. So um, please look at our EVP how procedures. Um, it does cover all of this information and we'll work with your institution if things do unfortunately get delayed due to you know, unfortunate circumstances. So for the home buyer education and counseling, we do not require the certificate at enrollment, but we do train on this. So your institution is aware that we need the certificate at time of disbursement so your buyer does have to complete the education and counseling and i did in the handouts provide our list of acceptable agencies uh, we do take it from these three resources um, and online education is acceptable but it's only through either eHome america finally home or framework and we do require counseling it's either prior to or post. And if your institution has a certificate where your buyer might have done this online component from either of these three resources that we um, allow, they can opt out of the counseling. And our regulation is very specific that we need the counseling component. So your institution will have to ensure they at least complete that, which is why we love for your organization to coach your buyers to go work with an approved agency on our respective list. And here's an example of a certificate in Massachusetts where a buyer did the education through framework, but they went through Massachusetts Affordable Housing Alliance. And then that agency, Maha, then administers, once they've completed all of the modules, the certificate of completion, but then they require that one-on-one -on -one counseling before or after. And this is pretty in trend with a lot of um, housing finance agencies throughout New England. So we, we do kind of uh, emulate this requirement. We won't accept anything from Freddie Mac. We won't accept MGIC. And then I know Fannie Mae has a, um, a home ready uh, we don't have that approved at this time. It is um, not as much of a, di a deeper dive as Framework, although Fannie Mae does have a partnership with Framework, so that is an eligible resource. And if you're ever unsure about the certificates before closing, just email us. We're more than happy to look at the certificate and say that it, it, it passes the test, and um, that way it doesn't hold up a disbursement because we have had unfortunate circumstances where buyers have gone through an ineligible agency and we've had to make that member financial institution have them take something post-closing, which essentially does um, hold up your reimbursement of the grant. So if we are reviewing your disbursement and we do not have all satisfactory documentation, the file gets put into member action required, or we like to, um, we're very acronym heavy at the Federal Home Loan Bank, MAR. So if we're missing documentation or we need some clarification of certain documents, um, you have 10 business days to provide or explain the documentation. And these are some examples of missing items that we typically see which is why I 
highly recommend uh, using our member QC checklist that I have in the handouts because hopefully these are um, tools that you can implement before closing and requesting the reimbursement. So monitoring retention. So although there is um, no P&I, it is a five-year retention period for both of our programs. And the way our mortgages and notes are written, you are the funder of the grant and um, also the first mortgage lender. We are just uh, subsidizing uh, the, the, the grant amount, if you will. So you need to remain the point of contact. You need to provide the household's um, contact information for your institution. So somebody on the servicing side, typically, it doesn't matter if you're selling your first mortgage on the secondary market, you cannot sell the grant with it. You have to keep that for five years on your books and just making sure you have the retention documents and the EVP how disclosure for that homeowner on file and then execute all discharges. And we're not responsible for recording or the associated fees. So that's just something to be mindful from a servicing standpoint. And also that disclosure that we give the borrower at time of um, initial reservation, the first four pages go into this in extreme detail, letting them know that there is a lien on the property. If you go to refinance or sale, there are certain protocols that need to take place or if unfortunately they're foreclosed on, um, here's how those types of areas are handled. And like I said, I can't stress enough that after the five years, remember to discharge the grant. If there's a way in your system that you can flag this to um, set a reminder. Also, our community lending platform does have a way that you can actually extract an Excel spreadsheet with all of your reservations and it will uh, project from, based on the information that you have entered into the system. So say this closed on um, you know, May 1st of this year, it'll project out when the retention period is up. So it's a good tool that you can have on file, um, especially where a lot of banks and credit unions might go through some mergers. Um, sometimes they are um, unsure of what that prior organization has participated in with either of our program. And then during the five-year retention, if they refinance, they can subordinate. We're gonna talk about that. If they sell the property, we call that our recapture. That's essentially a payoff. We're gonna discuss that today. And if unfortunately the um, homeowner is foreclosed on, it is forgiven. We do need specific documentation, evidencing that that has officially taken place. And also another unfortunate circumstance, uh, if the homeowner has passed away, it is forgiven. So those are subject to grant forgiveness. The subordination process, it's pretty simple. Um, I think this is what makes this program so friendly when you are doing that five-year monitoring component. There is no rigorous underwriting process. It is just that the homeowner or their uh, bank attorney will contact you, the lender, and then your institution must submit either our EVP or how subordination template to the bank and we will just do our review with our legal team and give you the green light to be able to execute it and then we just require a uh, electronic copy we don't require the recorded copy um, just because from a time standpoint we just want to make sure that we can um, close the books with your institution on that we do not care if a uh, buyer gets a HELOC or a cash out you just want to make sure um, whatever refinance um, meets that lender's parameters. But we, the Federal Home Loan Bank, we promote equity within the home, which is why we have such a, um, a shortened subordination process that might be different from um, secondary market. So if a homeowner decides to sell the property, prior to the five-year retention period, 
they might contact your institution or their closing attorney or their realtor. We're going to default them to your institution. Uh, your institution is responsible to execute the discharge. So if we do receive contact from outside parties, just remembering our relationship is with your organization. So we will provide in writing the recapture requirements through our cycle that we have reflected here. And the main component is submitting the most final seller CD because that's how we do our recapture. It's not a simple payoff that's a per diem proration. It encompasses a lot of detail that the Federal Housing Finance Agency has bestowed on us. That includes that pro rata divvied out by days or months from when they buy to when they sell, but then we also include their household investment. And of course, if they're getting an extensive amount of net proceeds, um, you know, the chances of having it forgiven are probably unlikely, but for every year that they've really lived in the home, that's where that pro rata kind of starts. And just knowing that they're never gonna have to pay back the full grant amount, but the goal is to diminish any money. That's why we do this kind of intricate calculation, if you will, because we don't wanna take back the money. And when we do, we do have to recycle it back out into um, the low to moderate income for equity builders specifically. Um, how is voluntary, but we do operate this procedure the same. Uh, the other thing is, is if it's 2,500 or less, no funds are due back to us, but if it's over a dollar, that's when we will work through all the steps and all of the calculations to see if we can alleviate any potential recapture of the money. And we will notify your institution after we've done that two-tier review. Our procedures have a very detailed section on this, but we also give this information to the borrower. So if they ever have questions saying, I never knew this was um, potentially being paid back, you can always reference that document, which is why I think it's important from a servicing standpoint to keep that disclosure in hand with that note and mortgage, because it does explain these requirements, because we know that the buyers are always you know, signing all the pieces of paper, Sometimes we lose sight of those sight of those components, and we do understand they have a lot of um, paperwork to sign. So it can be an overwhelming process, but at least you have this to be able to have it in hand and assure them that they knew all this information up front. I do have a couple of questions. Do does the original need to be retained, or can they be retained electronically? Electronically is fine. That's not a problem. And also when you're talking about either the EVP, how notes and mortgages, we don't require you to send us the originals. You can keep those on hand or you can scan them or if you're selling on the secondary market and they need a copy, um, we don't keep any of that in-house because like I said, essentially the instruments read that we're only the funder of the grant, your organization is the lender. So tips and tricks, do not tell the borrower that the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston is responsible to executing the discharge. It is your institution. Definitely do not please try and calculate the recapture. As I mentioned, it's not a traditional payoff and we do need two business days. So if you're getting a notice that a closing is happening in an hour, we always caution you just to tell the buyer that this is a two-tier review. It requires two business days. Hold back the entire grant. And then after they sell the property, we can work through the numbers. But don't try to calculate it on your own because it does not operate the same. Additionally, don't tell a homeowner that we do not allow subordinations or refinances, especially for HELOCs. As I mentioned, we promote equity within the home. And always reach out to us for either a subordination or recapture. We'll provide you our template for either the EVP or how subordination. Um, and always refer the homeowner to the third and fourth pages of that disclosure, as I specifically mentioned, that talks about all that post-closing information. 
and then keep a list, um, whether it's in your LOS system and just that way you can flag and remember when to execute the discharge. I wish that we did have a component in our instruments that said that it was automatically discharged. Unfortunately, it's something that we have not been able to proceed with, but um, we have heard a lot of feedback about that. Stay tuned. Um, we always provide recommendations to the Federal Housing Finance Agency on how we can make this more streamlined for your institution, um, which is why for now we have uh, had that cap we have that capability of you being able to extract an Excel spreadsheet uh, live time, so you can take that and hard code that somewhere or keep it on file um, within your loan servicing department. I actually wanted to do a couple poll questions just to see if um, everybody, hold on one second. All right. Let's see. All right. So which online education resources are acceptable? Feel free to weigh in. And you can select more than one. Um, and I do apologize for not saying that. All right, I'm just gonna give it a couple more seconds. People are still weighing in. All right, I'm going to close that out. And I'm going to share the results. So uh, the answers are eHome America, Finally Home, and Framework. So not the Credit Smart Freddie Mac or MGIC. I do have another poll I would like to open. Who is the homeowner's main contact? I hope we get 100% on what is the answer. All right. I'm gonna share it. All right, so, okay, we have 99%. So it is your financial institution. The Federal Home Loan Bank is not the main point of contact. We do have to continue that partnership with your institution where you're the lender. Um, naturally, we can um, work with the homeowner or an attorney, or if they go to another organization and direct them back to your institution, and especially where we have to administer and review subordinations and recaptures, but essentially it's it's you, the uh, the member financial institution of our organization. We do have some more questions. Are we allowed to collect the discharge fee from the borrower at closing? So yes, you, you can. Um, we do understand it is an extra lien on the property, which does include additional recording fees. Um, we don't have any stipulations that says you can't record them all into uh, to one um, with your first mortgage. It really just depends on where your registry of deeds and what they can allow. But yes, we do see people um, collecting that fee from them just because a lot of organizations aren't typically gonna foot that recording fee so just letting them know um just typical when you are going through that those cd figures just letting them know that you know every document that has to get recorded does come with a price with that respective registry of deed if the first lien is sold and released on the secondary market does the originating lender still need to track and handle the discharge on the grant yes you cannot sell the grant and you still do have to monitor within that five-year retention period. Will the 2023 note and mortgages be available? Yes, they actually are on our website right now. You can, when you're on the FHLB Boston website, 
there is a section called forms and applications and then there is a filter where you can select either EBP or how. Uh, we do have a separate one for the state of Connecticut where they do require uh, two witnesses on their um, their notary sections and then the um, rest of the New England states specifically are all in one. Additionally, we do have a deed restriction mortgage. That's specifically for FHA loans only. They require some specific wording that our legal department has worked with FHA um, in completing. If a property has a deed restriction or an affordable covenant, if you will, our note and standard mortgage does have a section that says subordinate mortgage or deed restriction. So we don't require you to execute both the deed restriction and the standard mortgage. It's one or the other. So just one in doubt, if it's an FHA loan, use the deed restriction. If not, you're gonna use that standard mortgage. Uh, another question is what is ideal way? So that is your institution's um, GL uh, bank account system with the Federal Home Loan Bank. So anytime your institution uh, requests an advance or any other product that's administered throughout the Federal Home Loan Bank, we are going to be crediting your ideal way account, which does go to a specific account that your institution has deemed um, for the credit or debit aspect. And if you're ever unsure of it, uh, your accounting department will know what that is. If not, tell them to reach out to our bank operations. They handle all that part of the um, operating standpoint. And here is our contact list. These slides are a little older. We actually do have an additional analyst this year. Um, in addition to Jack, who joined with us last year and then Kevin and then we do have Isabel and obviously reach out to any of us as a resource including Livia she's our AVP and our operations manager um, please use these key resources and always just ask questions uh, we're happy to work with you uh, we love working with your institution on these programs and we just want to make sure that you have all the tools to be successful. So I'll open up if anyone has any other questions. Oh, I actually do have one question I missed. I do apologize. Can the prepaid appraisal be considered as part of the borrower's minimum contribution if we're able to show it coming from the borrower's bank account? So yes, it can be. Um, if it's something that's under the uh, the loan closing fees, such as an appraisal, um, typically, yes, that can be um, a portion of the minimum contribution. Uh, if you ever have questions about that, especially where how does have a 3% minimum contribution and EVP only has a $500, that's because they're for in different income brackets. EVP is for low to moderate income. And typically to uh, this question, appraisal fees are typically within the $500 range, give or take. So yes, we would uh, take that into consideration. And we have um, updated our EVP how procedures to be a little more relaxed and clear on that. But always ask if you're unsure if your borrower has met the minimum contribution for either program before closing. Well, thank you again. Really appreciate everyone taking the time out of their busy days to learn about the disbursement process. And we look forward to working with you this year. Thank you.